Yeah, well, first of all, it's nice to be here uh, at my first uh, one of these as, as CEO. I mean, you probably know I've been involved with the IMI for a long time. Uh, five years as chairman, three years as president, sort of 10 years or so on the council and then the board. Um, but it's very different, actually, swapping sides. And before I go into the details, it will be kind of remiss of me not to kind of say something a little bit about the, the first four months. Um, I always knew the IMI had a, a very good team. But I have to say, I've been uh, massively impressed by the quality of the people, the, 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 the dedication of the team at Fanshawe's. Because there's a degree of detail that as a non-executive director you, 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 you don't see. Um, and and the, uh, you know, th there's, there's huge potential in the organisation, there really is. Uh, um, there's a lot of very good things which you'll hear about today that are going on across the whole piece, but there's massive potential in that group of people at Fanshawe's. Um, and it's my job over the next uh, however long uh, to unlock that because we're going into a, you know we have a, when I when I arrived I, I guess I had the, the luxury of a strategy which was largely formed uh, to, uh, not, not on every part of the business but certainly we do a lot of government funded work um, and that funding was, was uh, uh, has another year to run uh, uh, and, and so a lot of th there's an, a great deal that, that's being done on behalf of the sector that's being paid for, uh, um, and, and that engages a lot of the people at Fanshawe's. But we have to look beyond that. I'm not saying that there, there may well be more government funding to come. There probably will be actually, but it's better for us to plan as though there won't be, so that uh, we have uh, you know we can justify our activities on a if you like on a commercial basis. Uh, because I, I, you know, and, and I, I'm not worried about that at all. I come from a commercial background, and actually, when I look at the potential in the organisation, I'm pretty sure that we can uh, 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 go with a very bright future there. But I just thought it was worth mentioning that. <coughs> Sorry, having having been the, being sort of new to the organisation in, in terms of being there full time. Uh, what what this presentation is about is is. Uh, an overview of some of the activities that we're involved in across the whole piece, really, across the whole motor sector. Um, and it's starting off with um, uh, just some of the sort of big information about the sector. You know, it, it, there's no getting away from it. It's, uh, it, it's a, a massive contributor to the, uh, uh, to the economy. 13 point, 138 billion uh, pounds turnover and 23.5 23 billion gross value added to the economy. Um, it's interesting because there are, there used to be 22 sector skills councils, uh, there are now 18 actually, but of all the sector skills councils, we are, we're, we're not the biggest, in fact we're one of, we're one of the smallest, uh, but we are, um, I, I think that that's only looking at it when you, ta when you take out the manufacturing element. Because I know that you guys know that I came from BMW, and I mean I know that BMW alone contributes one percent to to our balance of payments just through the sort of mini factory and the and the exports that go from the mini and the engine factory. So when you add in Honda and and, and you know uh, uh, Nissan and all the other people people that, and Jaguar Land Rover that are making cars in this country, the motor sector overall is a huge huge contributor. More big numbers. Um, 35.3 million UK registered cars, car, well, cars, motorcycles, and trucks on our roads. It's interesting, actually, that um, if you read the sort of press, um, the, the European industry is horribly depressed at the moment. Actually, uh, uh, there's hard, some of the numbers you see coming out for, uh, are, are pretty scary. Actually, when you look at, um, you know, you see uh, brands saying that they're 25 percent down in the first quarter across Europe. Now, that's 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 big stuff. The only market in Europe where the numbers are going forward is actually the UK. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think it's, uh, people all, uh, you can be glib about it and say, oh, well, it's kind of, they've always treated the UK as Treasure Island. I mean, that was a, that was a, coin, that was a, a phrase that was coined a few years ago uh, when the exchange rate meant that manufacturers made a lot more money selling cars here than they did elsewhere. That's not really the case anymore. But there's a much, in my view, and I've seen the industry around the world, I think it's because the industry is more professional in the UK. Give, give, the, UK industry, give the UK dealers a car and they'll find a way to sell it. You know, I mean, uh, a, a, a former colleague of mine always used to say there's no such thing as a car you can't sell, it's just about finding the right price for it. 
Um, we have, we have a, a, an extremely professional industry that's very good at that, between the manufacturers and the dealers. They find a, they find a route to market. And that's why I think this market is moving ahead, despite the fact that you know, the economic situation is not great. Um, over half a, half a, uh, a, uh, a billion people uh, employed in the industry, that's just in our sector. Um, you know, it, it, when you think of all the related sectors through engineering and so on, it's actually, I mean, our effect is a lot bigger than that, I think. This is just retail automotive, so that's not manufacturing and so on. And um, that's the other interesting thing. We have, I, I said that there are now 18 sector skills councils, and, and we're not the biggest, but we're, we're undoubtedly the most diverse. Um, you know, w there are certain sectors, you know, where you've got four or five big employers, and they, pretty, they make up about 85% of, of the entire sector. Um, stu uh, some of you know there's an organisation called the Independent Garage Association, which comes under the, RM the Retail, Motor Retail Motor Industry Federation's umbrella. So the Retail Motor Industry Federation these days is kind of a holding company with the Independent Garage Association and the National Franchise Dealers Association. It's kind of a nice, neat way in, in which they can now have two opinions in the same building, basically, <laughs> and often do. They've, they've been having a dust-up in the press recently, I think, about MOTs and stuff. But um, Stuart James, who runs the Independent Garage Association, has got 27,000 of those companies as members, the Independent Garage Association. And he says that only 50% of them have a, an email address. And that kind of gives you a, an idea of the sort of size of the challenge you have when you're trying to embrace the whole sector. Um, sorry, jumped ahead a bit. Right, there we go. Um, so what are the things that, 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 that we're here to do? And I'll talk about these in a bit more detail. Certainly changing public perception of the sector. You know, as I go around, I've spent the first four months going around talking to lots of different stakeholders, lots of different businesses and stuff. And what you're struck by is the level of investment in the industry and just how forward-looking it is. But we're, you know, we all know we're still kind of stuck with the public perception which is formed by Phil Mitchell on EastEnders or the bloke from uh, Coronation Street or, you know, Arthur Daly or whatever. And in truth, you know, there are elements of the industry that, that are like that, but they are tiny and, and, and they're not reflective of that half a billion people who are, you know, <coughs> professional and dedicated and particularly those people that we represent directly who, who have invested in their professionality, if you like. Um, and, you know, we want, uh, part of, part of uh, uh, attracting and retaining new talent is, is creating a different perception of the industry because you know one of the things that doesn't matter what brand you are even great brands like Mercedes or BMW where I came from it's it's still not easy to convince parents that it's a good industry for their kids to come into you know they, they don't aspire to their children they'd like their children to be doctors or solicitors or accountants but not working them I've often said that you know the greatest disappointment to my mum was the fact that I gave up chartered accounting and coming to the motor industry she didn't really forgive me until I said to her, I've just been made a director of BMW. And then she didn't know what the hell that meant, but she could go down the hairdressers and have a bit of a boast about that. You know? But I, 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 was, I was definitely um, the black sheep for, for stepping out of a profession. You know, she didn't realise I'd actually stepped into a profession. But there you go, that's what we have to deal with. Um, ensuring that future and, uh, and, and current skills needs are met. You know, this is a massively dynamic industry. I was at uh, Jaguar Land Rover the other day and I went into their engineering centre and stood in a room like this where they had, they had basically, you know, you, you were walking through 3D images of cars, you know, walking, being able to walk through and sit in the thing, full, you know, full size, walk through the dashboard and see all, everything that's going on behind it, walk through the engine and see it working. And this is how they design and engineer cars these days. And, and you know, and that, all of that sooner or later finds its way out into the retail sector and, and that's, you know, that's, what we're, that's what we're having to deal with. But that's exciting though and that's one of the reasons why people should join our industry, isn't it? Um, the other thing, uh, and, and I'll talk a bit about this, this is a big thing for us at the moment, is the whole management and leadership thing. Because uh, there's, there's an old saying that uh, people don't leave companies, they leave people. You know, and the quality of uh, management and leadership in, in a business is critical. You know, I've never known a well-led business be unprofitable. I've so, but I've known plenty of poorly-led businesses be unprofitable. So it's, it's a key factor in business. 
Um, and it's one that, uh, right across the sort of industry, we're in, we're in dialogue with a, a, an awful lot of key players in the industry about this, but I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, and then ensuring that businesses understand the benefits of upskilling staff. You know, it, when I train somebody, is it a cost or is it a benefit? And hopefully I can answer that question a little bit later. Yeah, changing perceptions and increasing customer confidence. Um, you guys will know that we launched the professional register uh, and hopefully you know uh, most of you if not all of you have been in and had a look on the on the website and understand a little bit more about it um, there is this huge investment made by the industry in, in training and developing people and, and and actually it's not generally recognized outside I mean people people just are, are unaware of it uh, and, and as individuals uh, where do people, how do people differentiate you if you're a properly trained and, and competent individual from somebody who's not? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing, but a lot of people have said to me, you know, oh, in your job, you need to engage with government and get them to, to license our industry. Well, I can tell you, I've had that conversation many, many times, but <coughs> I don't believe that anything like that's going to come anytime soon. It's not on anyone's agenda. Uh, a few years ago, we had something called a super complaint being threatened against the industry. This came off the back of a witch report that damned the industry and said, you know, you're all so bad, we're going to have to look at the lot of you and find a way of possibly legislating against you. And, uh, and that threatened us with licensing. That's where ATA came from, basically. I mean, that's, that was the, the head of steam behind ATA. We were looking at it anyway, but it certainly helped get it off the ground that, that, there was a, that we were being threatened with licensing. And it was better to have our own scheme than to have one imposed upon us by the Office of Fair Trading who wouldn't understand what a good scheme looked like. Um, but that's sort of dissipated and gone away. And in fact, the whole issue about sort of uh, the, the, the consumer piece, uh, as far as it you know, affects the motor industry, has been, in some ways you could say, delegated downwards to trading standards. <coughs> that having been said, I mean, trading standards are very supportive of what we're doing. Um, uh, so I don't think that there will be an automatic, you know, uh, uh, license. To, that, that this government certainly aren't looking at a license to practice. They've got too many other things on their mind, and they've only got 18 months to run anyway. And um, I don't honestly believe the next government will come in with that high on their agenda either. But it is important for us. I mean, I, we had a new guy started with the organisation yesterday, and he said to me, "Voluntary license to practice isn't that an oxymoron?" And, and it kind of is in a way, if you think about it, you know, uh, um, uh, but nevertheless, that's what we've got. That's the kind of bill of goods we've got. And, and if we want to represent ourselves as a, a professional uh, industry, then we have to have our own mechanisms to do it. And that's what the professional register is all about. Uh, and, it, and it enables uh, individuals <coughs> to demonstrate their, their, their professionality and their skills and their qualifications and actually businesses as well because you know businesses that employ those people can also be publicly searched on the register what i don't want you to think we're doing this is not another motor industry code there are enough of those already you know um what we do want though um, we've had we've had ongoing dialogue with all the other all the motor industry codes you know motor codes bosch good garage schemes you name it trust my garage i think that the uh, uh, Independent Garage Association are, are now pushing forward. Um, none of them up to now have actually had within them anything that says anything about people. Um, and we're working very closely with trading standards who, who oversee all of these codes to say this, this is the bit that should be in there. And they're actually very open to that and they're very supportive of it. So it's the kind of first step towards putting some meat into these things. You know, uh, and, and uh, you know, I mean, this is just the first step, really. This is just the first step uh, uh, along the lines. But what we see is um, there's lots of work to do around this in terms of gaining the public perception behind it. But the, the end game is, is, is for consumers to understand that there is a way of telling the difference. You know, I, I think the bugbear for every one of us is that um, we can no longer change a plug at home, technically. You know, you've got to call a qualified electrician in to do it, haven't you? You know, and there was that, that idea that they had when you were supposed to produce a certificate with your, your house to show that you hadn't been messing around with the electrics and things like this. I'm glad they went away with it, but technically you can't change a plug. You can't play around with, uh, you can't change a, a socket. You can't play with 240 volts. But you could 
set yourself up to play with a 400 volt car, you know, which is absurd, isn't it? You know, uh, and, and while ever we have that situation where anybody can set themselves up and say, I'm now here to service your car, we need to be able to differentiate the, the good from the bad. And, and, and that's what this is all about. Um, and, and, I, and I believe it's, it's the right way forward and I think we'll gain, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see the efforts that we'll put behind this to gain traction with it going forward. Um, I've already kind of talked about this, but it's, you know, it, it, I, I think some of you will have seen the, there's a great little cartoon actually on the, uh, on the website, which if you haven't seen it's worth watching to see, you know, it's a very good sort of uh, easy way of explaining what it's all about. <laughs> we hate those images, don't we really, but you know, they are what they are. Um, attracting and retaining talent. Um, it's true to say that we have a, an aging workforce. Um, uh, uh, it, so we're not, we, we are struggling to, to attract the numbers of people we want. And even, it's, it's interesting, even brands like this, you know, you talk to them and, and, and they offer great career opportunities, but often, often struggle to fill the vacancies they've got with the appropriate quality of people. I think that, uh, and there are lots of issues around this, you know, there, there, there is, um, I, I was surprised last, last November, uh, uh, on behalf of the IMI, I went and uh, spoke at a, a, a career, the Institute of Career Guidance people, sort of, I can't remember exactly what they're called now, but they're, they're at their annual conference. And I didn't know, maybe you didn't either, you know, there, there is no formal careers guidance in England anymore. There is in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. But, but in England, it's been devolved to schools. Um, and the interesting thing is, if you, it's required to give children in, in middle school careers guidance, but it's not actually required to give 16-year-olds uh, careers guidance, which is bizarre, isn't it? Um, so somebody has to fill that gap. Um, and actually, again, you know, the, the, the sort of materials and the, and the collateral that's out there between all of the, you know, the retailers and the brands and so on is fantastic. But it's, it's, it's almost too much. It's not focused enough. It needs, you know, what, what's desperately needed is, is somebody to pull it all together and say, you know, we, this is to represent the sector as a whole. And that's, that's a, 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 a job we've, uh, that we've taken on. Um, I think we've got a fantastic uh, careers service through the, the IMI and a, and a brilliant jobs platform as well. Um, we, we have used some of the government funding to help bolster this side of, the, uh, side of things up. Um, our careers website, Auto City, is well worth a look if you haven't, if you haven't done that. But you know, we've got all these other elements of collateral here or, or that, that we provide to the sector to try and uh, help you know, bring in the appropriate quality of people. Uh, I think there's a link here as well to what we're doing on the management and leadership side because um, uh, the, the, more, the more that we can in, influence the people at the top, the more they're likely to channel their, their requirements through us. And I think those, you know, so it's a kind of circular piece, if you like. Um, apprenticeships. Uh, this is big news with government at the moment. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that we, we've known about apprenticeships for years and been supporting them for years. And the government has sort of suddenly rediscovered them. Uh, the two things that, that big hot themes with government at the moment uh, are apprenticeships and traineeships. Um, traineeships are this sort of idea where you take youngsters and give them six months training uh, in, in, in industry. Uh, I've got some questions around that, I have to say, about how it's going to work. They're going to launch it in September. I'm not aware of any organisation stepping forward yet and offering any, vac uh, offering any you know, vacancies. Um, and the shape of them is a bit, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to do an awful lot in six months, I believe. But that's an, an ongoing debate. What isn't in question is, is the whole apprenticeship piece. I mean, there, there's a lot of discussions about how apprenticeships will look going forward. But I mean, in terms of what we do, I mean, you can see we have all of, all of these frameworks. Um, and actually, you know, talking to some of the big employers around the sector, um, they're, 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 some of this noise around apprenticeships does seem to be getting through because talking to the guys at Jaguar Land Rover the other day, they said they're further ahead in terms of filling their vacancies than they've been in, in recent memory. Um, it was very funny because there, there's something called uh, 
there, there, there is a group of apprentices, 15 apprentices, from across the whole of industry and, and from every type of apprenticeship, you know, from uh, uh, graduate apprentices, you know, down to 16-year-olds, uh, who have, who, who, who go, go to Parliament every so often, go to the House of Parliament and represent their views. Director Matthew Hancock, who is the, uh, the skills minister, and they give him a bloody hard time, I've got to tell you. Uh, rightly so. They're, very, they're incredibly bright, in, incredibly, uh, 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 you know, well, their arguments are incredibly well thought through. And, they, and the, the interesting thing is, though, that there are any number of members of the Lords and, 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 and the House of Commons who turn up to this debate to hear it. And every one of them now says, you know, I, well, when I was an apprentice, and I think most of them, most of them went to university, but they don't admit to it anymore. You know, <laughs> apprentices are definitely hot news, you know. Um, uh, and uh, I think there is this general realization that sh shoveling loads and loads of youngsters through university to do, you know, degrees in video games uh, and, and to come out and have no jobs is crazy. There needs to be a balance in there. University places are, there's less of them around. It's more expensive to do it. Uh, and it's logical that the that, 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 that sort of vocational based training uh, is a way forward. So I think we can, we can definitely ride that wave and, and we're in a very good place to do that. Um, yeah, I, I think that, that uh, um, you know, the, 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 the thing about understanding future, uh, future skills needs is about our ongoing dialogue with the sector. We, we have uh, uh, we, we have fantastic, fantastic and increasingly good support from across the sector, from, all, from the big employers. We, we work with something called the HR Directors Forum, who are the HR directors of all of the big retail groups, um, you know, and who between them uh, are, are actually, as employers, are bigger than most of the manufacturers are in the UK. You think how big are Inchcape are and, and, and Pendragon and, and Sitna and groups like this. Um, but I mean, they're not. The, that, that's just one forum that we have, which helps us to understand, you know, what it is that the sector is requiring, uh, and, and, and to ensure that we're in a position to provide it. Um, CPD, uh, our continuous professional development. It's it's been a requirement with, through our dialogue with you as members. Um, We've listened and we've put, I, I was really, I mean, when I looked at the, you have to, as somebody who's had a, 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 a training academy reporting to me for the last 20 years, um, I, I, I've got a reasonable idea what a good prospectus looks like and, and the CPD offer looks like a good prospectus. It's got, you know, I mean, these guys here at Mercedes offer us training, I think Scania do next door. Um, there's some great offers in there. The only problem is that the take up on it is really, really poor. So, we, so that's something that we have to do something about. Um, I think that, I mean, we've got other ideas. We're looking at incorporating possibly, you know, an e-learning platform and things like that in there. But, you know, uh, I, I think this, is, this all ties in with uh, some of the, uh, the stuff we've been doing on the return on investment in training, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute. Um, but certainly, the, you know, the, the, the engagement is there. We've got plenty of people who are willing to offer us very, very high quality training. Um, and you know we've just got to keep the dialogue open to find out why it is that people aren't using it and what we have to do to make sure that it is used. Management leadership piece. Um, some of you remember that, uh, well all of you remember I hope, uh, that, that a few years ago uh, off the back of ATA we launched something called AMA, Automotive Management Accreditation. Um, actually it was a, a really well thought through product really really well put together, um, typical of the IMI really, I mean don't do things by halves. Um, but gaining traction with it was slow and, and of course unlike ATA, it didn't have a super complaint behind it that was driving people to, to do something, it, so it was, it was a great solution but at that point in time the, the, um, not too many people had defined the problem. Um, Flick forward to, to this year, uh, uh, or, or, or sort of the end of last year, and I, I think that coming out of, yeah, this is a little bit of conjecture here, but I mean, whatever the reasons are, the, the, the results are good. Um, I believe that a lot of uh, uh, people in the industry have realised that, that coming through a really tough economic situation like we had, um, one of the factors in surviving that is, is the quality of the leadership you've got in your business. Um, 
not just because good leaders understand what to do, but because good leaders engage the people in their business, and nobody can do it all on their own. So, so uh, uh, I, that's my personal conjecture, but for whatever reason, we are currently in dialogue with 24 uh, brands, manufacturers, as well as this HR Directors Forum we were talking about, and a number of other organisations, about developing what I, I believe has been a low-hanging fruit for a long time, uh, a need for the industry, which is a common currency for management leadership training. I think what the HRD Forum told us was, and you can understand their position, these guys represent any number of brands, and they say, I, I bring in somebody and I train them up in this brand and I do everything the brand asks me to do. You know, I let them assess this guy before he even joins the brand, put him through all the management training, then I want to move him from that brand to that brand, and, that, and, and, and the next, next brand says, well, we don't recognise any of that. He's got to go right back to the bottom of the pile and start again. Well, that's patently ludicrous. It's ludicrous from both sides of the coin because it's ludicrous for the, for the retailer because that's a whole load of duplicated cost. It, it, it's actually ludicrous for the manufacturers as well because they're duplicating cost as well. You know, the truth is, is you know, I was very proud of the BMW Academy. Some of you have been there. and, I, and I, uh, it, it, It's a fantastic operation. But BMW is not a training company. You know, we're in business to sell, they were in business to sell cars and parts, not to train people. So, you know, it, it, I only wanted us to do the training that was necessary, not, the tra not training for training's sake. It's the worst thing in the world you can have in, in, in an academy is to be walking up the stairs and hear somebody go, oh, hi, you know, what are you doing here? I don't know, I was just sent, I think we have to hit a number or something. You know, it's the worst thing in the world, you know, because you realise you're kind of failing. And everybody, everybody who runs an academy has heard that at some point in time. Um, but what you don't need is to be, what, what makes absolute sense is to, is to have a standard that everybody works to. For a whole load of reasons really, because it's, it's also part of the way we project ourselves out to uh, prospective people wanting to come into the industry. It's much easier to lay out a career path for people if it's broadly the same career path. You know, if people understand that, well actually, if I want to get on in this industry, wherever I choose to go, these are the routes I should be following. And, and actually, I won't be wasting my time for two or three years with this em employer by, you know, if I follow that path and then want to move somewhere else because I can pick up the threads when I go to the next place. And it, it, it's blindingly obvious, really, but it, it, um, I'm, I think we're rightly very excited about the fact that we have this kind of dialogue ongoing with so many big players. Um, and that uh, that dialogue is moving into um, a, a actual realization. Uh, you know, we're uh, it's, it, I, I can't. It's wrong of me to sort of uh, jump the gun and talk about who some of these people are, because some of them have got <coughs> internal discussions to go on and so on, so forth. But I'm I'm very confident that some of the really major brands will be delivering AMA as their sort of ultimate outcome of their management and leadership training. And I think that that's uh, uh, and, and and I believe that will have a snowball effect. Certainly, uh, um, you know, we're at that level of advancement with the discussions, and I think that's fantastic. Because again, I, I you know, I go back to what I said earlier. I, 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 you know, the interesting thing is that as a as a, as a sector, um, and it says there at the top, you know, only fifth. The, the thing, the nice thing about the motor industry is it's a meritocracy. So you can start as an apprentice, and you can, you know, look at Trevor Finn, who, who's the chief executive of Pendragon. You know, started as an apprentice. Him and his Second in command, Martin Cash has started as apprentices. They're running what is the biggest dealer group in the UK. And, and I can give you lots of other examples. I employed a guy, uh, what was it, 25 years ago, who's now the worldwide sales and marketing director uh, for Mini. But I employed him as, a as an apprentice technician in our workshop. Um, don't know where I went wrong. Uh, <laughs> but no, it, you know, so this is great. It's brilliant that you can, you can talk about those things. And I wouldn't... We wouldn't want that to change, would we? we you know, it's great that, you, you, that, that we recognise ability and it's not all just about qualifications. But that on its own is not enough. You know, you, you need both. You need both. You need talented people to come in at the appropriate levels as well. And we don't really have that in the motor industry. 15% of managers are actually qualified to do what they do. Now, if you compare us to the other 18 or recently 22 sector skills councils, the average for all those other sector skills councils is 47%. So there's a, there's a huge yawning gap there. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to, to fill. It's not about, it's about professionalizing the sector. Uh, because 
by doing that, we, 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 we attract more professionals in and it becomes a more, a, 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 a more aspirational place to, to be. The business benefits of upskilling the workforce. One of the great things about having the government funding is, and this has been one of, you know, there are two, two massive questions that vex you in the motor industry. One is, you know, actually in all industries really, but, but talking about our own sector, you know, if I invest in training, is it a cost or is it a benefit? I mean, the other one, I guess, is, you know, is achieving customer satisfaction actually, does it, does it make me more money, you know? But that's, that's for another day. Uh, to, to, although actually, um, the team that are looking at this have touched on that because one of the strands they're looking at <coughs> is exactly that with, with one of the uh, uh, employers is, you know, they've invested a lot of money in their managers and, and one, of the, one of the key outcomes was we want to improve our customer satisfaction. So we're touching on both of those things. But um, I know that, you know, again, having been involved in the sector for a long time, I've, I've done it before, I've done sort of I've provided dealers with calculations to show them that apprentices are worth investing in because, they, because there is a direct payback, it's not just the cost. Um, and I know lots of other people have done things like this, but what we're talking about is something on a, a whole different scale of, uh, of, of magnitude, really. And we, we've got a gentleman called Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul Spear working with us. And, and Paul is an extremely bright man. Um, uh, and he's been working with uh, the University of Leicestershire on this uh, very wide-ranging uh, return on investment piece, looking at lots and lots of different uh, elements of, uh, of, of training to show. We've done, I mean, we've already done some studies which are available, but I mean, the, these, we expect the current work to, to start to be, to produce reports round about the end of the year. And we've got this huge interest in this, huge interest in this, not just from our sector, but uh, lots of the other sectors are coming to us. I mean, Sarah, Sarah Sillers is desperately keen to get this, you know, to take some of this, uh, this work into centre where she's working now. Because uh, it's one of those key questions, isn't it? It's those key imponderables, you know. I mean, I, I, was, I, I, I like what Bill Gates said, you know, the only thing worse than uh, training somebody and having them leave is not training them and having them stay, you know, uh, and 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 that's that's a lovely like kind of trip off the tongue saying, but it it would be nice to prove that, wouldn't it? Uh, and that's what this work is all about. And I believe it will be, you know, some of the studies we've done already, as this says, you know, have shown returns on investment of 97 to 187 um, percent. And it's one of those things that kind of, you know, having been involved in training people for many years, I I know it, but you need to be able to prove it. You need to be able to prove it and to the to the people who otherwise wouldn't do it, you know. And that's probably that, that's, there's probably a link to that, and one of the reasons why we don't sell enough CPD actually, you know, that that, that people are seeing the upfront cost rather than the, you know, uh, the, the benefit that comes out the back of it. But that's a a, a great piece of work, and I think we're uh, very excited about you know what we're already seeing from it. So I've been rabbiting on a bit. <laughs> There, but I mean, I, I hope that's given you a sort of a, a good overview of what we're trying to do. It is, as, as, as the Spratly says, all about professionalising the sector. I mean, you know, you're, I'm preaching to the converted here. This is why you're, you're members. You guys are all, all professionals, but we want to spread the message further. It's a very, very big and very diverse sector. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the more that we can. Uh, project ourselves as, uh, as a place to be. I, I was talking to a young lad yesterday, actually, he was at university, he's, he's my dentist's son, actually, um, and he wants to join the motor industry. It's brilliant, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. I spent ages on the phone with him um, because it's very easy to evangelize about something you believe in. I don't believe anybody could ever have a wasted career in the motor industry. I mean, you can have a bad time because that, you know, that can happen in any industry, but the opportunities are fantastic and, and, and uh, the more we can get that across, uh, uh, the more successful all of our businesses will be. So.